Um, I'd like to explain to you what was the thought process behind August 5, because that would then uh, answer a lot of what you asked me. Now, the thought process was this. Uh, I think many of you who know Indian history will recall that there were about 600 or princely states at the time of uh, independence who were given a choice of joining India or Pakistan, and uh, or most of them made up their minds. Uh, one which held out uh, in indecision at that point of time was the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And at that time, Pakistan uh, tried to force the issue by really uh, invading uh, Kashmir. And that uh, decision went the other way, which was uh, Jammu and Kashmir decided to join India instead of Pakistan. Now, the first point which I'd like you to uh, recall is all the states joined the Indian Union in exactly the same terms of conditions. Uh, that they actually had a form. I, I have a picture of the accession, uh, instrument of accession that the Maharaja of Kashmir signed. All of them had a form, the blank parts of the form where the name of the state, the name of the ruler, the date of accession. Otherwise, it was exactly the same. Now, initially when they joined, all of them agreed uh, that they would cede to the union the rights, uh, you know, the powers on foreign affairs, defense, and communications. And then as the Indian constitution uh, came into being, uh, you know, the, the idea was that uh, they would, uh, each one of them, uh, accede to the constitution in question. And they were participants in the constitution-making process. So as they acceded, they sent delegates. In, so it was like a Philadelphia convention where, you know, people then sent uh, their delegates as the convention progressed. And Jammu and Kashmir also sent uh, their delegates. Now, the situation in Jammu and Kashmir was peculiar for a number of reasons. And one of them was the fact, of course, that they were a border state but also that they were themselves under uh, attack at that time. So they, they, they had a desire to uh, extend the period of alignment with the rest of India uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the application of laws. Uh, and uh, the Constituent Assembly recognized that they were a very special case at that point of time. But there was then a big debate. So which parts of the Constitution do you accept? And at you know, what length of time would that take place? So this was not a simple decision. There was a lot of negotiation on it. You know, you look, there's a lot of correspondence on it. And all of this is actually uh, archival material today. Now, to cut a long story short, what happened at that time was that for to accommodate them, the only temporary article of the Constitution was drafted. Okay, I underline this, the only temporary article. Uh, this was what today we call Article 370. At that point, it was uh, numbered Article 306A. Now, immediately after that article was, the Constitution was adopted, you had a series of presidential proclamations under that article, which started aligning the state. Okay? Uh, in the last 70 years, you had 54 of these presidential proclamations. But here's what went wrong. Uh, the presidential proclamations were very rapid in the initial years, but as uh, you know, there was a climate of intimidation and separatism in Kashmir, they started to dry up. They started to dry up because the state politics was now, you know, uh, people found that there was an arbitraging possibility using the separate, you know, the, the 370 article, because 370 essentially uh, mandated uh, you know, one of the consequences of 370 was you had local ownership of property. You had, you know, which was a provision of another provision of the constitution called 35A. Uh, and there were restrictions in many ways of what would be normal economic activity in the state. Uh, so uh, over a period of time, you had really three consequences. Number one, you didn't have the economic activity and economic energy in Kashmir, in Jammu and Kashmir, that you had in the rest of India, which meant less jobs, less job opportunities, more sense of alienation, a sense of separatism, and therefore a climate for terrorism from across the border. The second was that the, the, the state was, in socio-economic terms, increasingly uh, less aligned with India. So if you look at all the progressive legislation of India, they did not apply to Kashmir because whenever you drafted a law in India, 
pretty much, you know, clause two or clause three of that law would say, but this law is not applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So what you had was, you didn't have right to work, you didn't have right to education, you didn't have right to information, you did not have affirmative action, uh, you did not have uh, the law against domestic violence, you didn't have uh, law on representation of women in local bodies, you didn't have equal, uh, you know, property laws between uh, men and women, you didn't have juvenile protection law. So uh, I can cite to you at least about a hundred important laws which did not apply to Jammu and Kashmir. Now, one was a political consequence, the uh, economic consequence, the second was a social consequence. But one and two really led to three, and that was a political consequence. Because what all of this it did was, it allowed really a, a sort of a narrow elite to arbitrage this 370, to monopolize uh, political power, to create a, a sort of a, a closed loop politics. And they had a vested interest in create, keeping alive separatist sentiment. Uh, so, and you had actually a situation where separatist political parties were openly allied with terrorist groups operating out of Pakistan. Now, here's the choice which the government faced. When we came back to power this May and did a Kashmir review, there were two choices. One was you had a set of policies which were on the books for 70 years, but for the last 40 years they were visibly not working. And by the way, when I say visibly not working, that meant in the last 30 years, 42,000 people got killed. The fact that the level of intimidation had reached uh, a height where you had senior police officers lynched on the streets of Srinagar, you had journalists who wrote against separatism who were assassinated, you had military, uh, uh, military personnel returning home for Eid who were kidnapped and killed. So, you know, uh, Pre-August 5, uh, please remember this, pre-August 5, Kashmir was in a mess. I mean, the difficulties in Kashmir have not started on August 5. August 5 is supposed to be a way of dealing with those difficulties. So the choices were either you continue what was clearly not working, or you tried something very different. And I think the decision was to try something very different. So our expectation today is by doing away with what was uh, uh, a temporary provision, <clears throat> what was meant as a bridge but became a barrier, uh, that uh, we will be able to push investments, economic activities into Kashmir, uh, that we will be able to uh, frankly change the economic landscape, change the social landscape. Now we realize it's not an uh, easy uh, exercise because there are deep vested interests which will resist it. Uh, and uh, so when you do this transition, our first concern was that there would be violence, uh, that there would be demonstrations, terrorists would use those demonstrations. And we had the experience of 2016 uh, when there was a very, there was a self-advertised terrorist cult figure who was killed, a gentleman called Burhan Wani. And after that, there was a spike in violence and about, I forget, about 50 plus people lost their lives. So the intention was uh, manage this transition situation without loss of life. Uh, so, uh, what the restrictions which came about gathering of people, about communication, these were intended to prevent that. Now, as the situation stabilizes, I think a lot of those restrictions would be rolled back. Already landlines are uh, reconnected. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the mobile towers have uh, started to be switched on. Uh, that, you know, uh, law, the schools are open, the uh, sort of uh, economic activity has picked up. Uh, a particular effort is being made to keep the supplies uh, at normal uh, in the state, so there's no shortage of food or medicine or supplies. This is harvest season for apples, so again, a particular effort is being made to procure apples so that the farmers don't feel that they've been victimized by these changes. But having said that, for us, the, uh, the primary concern would be uh, to prevent loss of life. And if I were to put the temporary, termination, temporary suspension of internet on one side of the scale and permanent loss of life on the other, I know which side I would go.